All right. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Find page 475 if you have the Baptist hymnal. And we're going to sing Victory in Jesus. Precious blood, blood told me. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He stopped me and bowed me with his redeeming blood. Praise God! He loved me there and I knew. And all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing. How he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He stopped me and bought me with his redeeming blood. Praise God! He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is to Him. You plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion He has built for me in glory, and I heard about the streets of gold. Beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing, and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there a song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. Praise God! He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. All right, and now page 33. To God be the glory. Really, it's he deserves to get all the glory. Every believer, the promise of God. 
job everything um don't have really a lot of announcements today we do want to get into the message very quickly got a lot to cover and hopefully not take too long with it so uh, uh, so let's get to our next song page 127 one day One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to the bone of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he, living he loved me. Dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they failed him to die on the tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified, freely forever, one day he's coming, a glorious day, one day they left him alone in the garden, one day he rested from suffering Angels came down or his tomb to keep it closed. Hope of the hopeless, my Savior is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far 
time in John 11. All right, this is going to be part four and uh, of miracles with messages. And, um, uh, and so uh, John wrote his gospel, the gospel of John, so that the world would know that Jesus is God's answer to every need, every desire we could possibly have, okay? Uh, he wanted us to see that Jesus was God, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior, and for us to believe on Jesus Christ, okay? John gave uh, these signs that, uh, that aren't just miracles, but proved that Jesus was God uh, at the time, all right, but to show uh, that, that proved not only that Jesus was, was God at the time, but to show by the messages that they bring that he is still who he said he was. Okay, that, that uh, these signs have messages and they're for all time, they're for all, all of us. And, uh, uh, and it proved that he was who he said he was, that he can still do mighty miracles and he's willing and wanting to do them for us um, and in us, that we might have life through his name. Now, let's look at John 20, verses 30 and 31. John 20 is our text verse, but we'll be over in 11 just in a minute. John 20, 30 and 31 says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not uh, written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Okay? And so, now, did you, did you see that last part? Like, life through his name. Jesus is God's answer to man's disappointments, to man's doubts, to man's disability, uh, to man's desires, to man's dismay, and to man's darkness. That's what we, we found out the last few weeks, okay? Uh, he has one final lesson in John, uh, or, or in the book of John, one uh, final miracle, okay, 
uh, which sums up and ties everything together. He wants us to have life, real, deep, abiding, overflowing, powerful, joy-filled life. Okay? Through Jesus' name. There's only one way to have life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Let's pray very quickly and get on in this. Father, I pray that you'd bless this message. Thank you for the reading and study of thy word. I pray that you, it would help everyone. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The seventh miracle, Jesus uh, raises Lazarus from the dead. This is the crowning one. This is the big one. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, we're in chapter 11. Now, it don't mean, um, or I'm sorry, it doesn't get any more real than this, raising somebody from the dead, all right? Uh, we only get one life. That's it. That's why the world and every individual can get so crazy so quick if something or someone threatens any part of our life. Yet with all our striving and searching and all that we can do, most people don't know or ever get a grasp on what life is or what it is meant to be, what life is supposed to be about what we were created for, what real life is. Now, in this miracle, John shows that Jesus had many lessons to teach on death and life. In so many ways, Jesus shows that life only comes through him, all right? Not just physical life, but eternal life and abundant life. Jesus is God's answer to man's death, all right? This is the final one. Jesus is God's answer to death, all right? Jesus raised the dead a couple of times before this already. Okay, but none so dead as this one. Okay, none so long dead. Uh, he was already thinking. He was already decaying. All right. Uh, Jesus raised Jairus' daughter. Now she had just died, was still in her own house on her own bed. Jesus raised her from the dead. That was a miracle. She was dead, but she hadn't been dead for very long. Then G Jesus, uh, going along, he saw a funeral procession. Uh, here was this widow who uh, her only family was her son, her only means of, of pro providing and all of that was her son, and he had died, and it was his funeral. He had just died. Uh, no doubt back then they had to have a funeral quickly after someone died before they started to decay and stink and all that, and uh, uh, and here was the funeral. Jesus sees the funeral, and he stops the funeral, he raises him from the dead, restores him to his mother, and uh, but he hadn't been dead. Uh, that long, longer than the girl, but but probably not very long, okay? <clears throat> but Lazarus, dead for four days, okay? No one could be deader than that. What great opportunity to work and prove himself that Jesus had and to preach and to teach and to bless. Now, let's look. We're going to go through this as quickly as I can, and I hope I can get through it quickly. Verse 1, we're going to start. Uh, verse 1 through 3, it says, Then Jesus, uh, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. I'm in the wrong chapter. Sorry, I knew that was wrong. Uh, it says, Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and his and her sister Martha, it was that Mary which anointed the Lord uh, with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, unto Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Now Jesus was really close to this family. You can tell by that. It was Mary that anointed his feet and all of that, and uh, he was very close to his family. Now he probably uh, when he would come through there, he would often stay with them and whatnot, all right? And he was he was uh, close friends with them. Now look at verse 4. It says, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby, all right? He says up front, Jesus says right away, 
God is going to be glorified, and so am I, because I am God. Okay, I'm going to be glorified in the Father. The Father is going to be glorified in, in me, the Son. Okay, he's going to get the glory out of all of this. He says, this is what it's for, to give God glory. Okay, now verse 6. <clears throat> Verse 5, Jesus loved Mary or Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Verse 6, when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Okay, now you might say, why would he hesitate? Why wouldn't he come rushing to him? Well, we're going to find out some of that here in just a minute. But I want to point out this. Sometimes God waits to answer or work in order to bless more and show and give more glory to himself. Okay? The greater the trial, the greater the hardship, the greater the tragedy, the greater the joy and the relief and the appreciation when he does come through and do it, because he does it more wonderful. Just by way of illustration, you know, I, I thought of our, our ball team years ago in Dulce, you know, the, the boys' basketball. We lost... I mean, we lost nearly every game for eight solid years. How sweet the victory was when finally having lost forever, okay, uh, lost every game. Uh, we lost, matter of fact, we lost every game the year before. And now, okay, how sweet it was. We got to come into the state tournament being in first place. The year before we had lost everything. And, and now we come in in first place, but <clears throat> our team captain broke his foot in the first game. <laughs> up and down, up and down, okay? Then, after knowing it was God who got us there, that it was he who willed that we be in this impossible situation, we knew it was him who was going to have to win it for us. So we trusted in him and that's what he did he with miracles i mean miracles and things that it was nothing to do with us he came through and gave us the state championship where everybody was watching and that's a key thing everybody was the town of dulce was aware okay the people at the state tournament was aware people came up to us just crying and weeping and saying i have never seen anything like that in my life god was working and doing miraculous things. He was doing miracles. And oh, how sweet. <laughs> how much appreciation we had. How much glory God got from it all. And yet, how we'd have never learned to trust him. We'd have never really appreciated it. Uh, we'd have never given him credit. If the very first year we had a ball team, we had a great team and success and victory and thought that we were good enough and deserved it. See, God had to wait. He had to let us lose for a long time. He had to bring us to that place and get us to that point where we finally were ready to trust him and give him the credit and the glory and, and thanks and all that and let him be seen. Okay? And so... Uh, uh, sometimes God waits. It says he waited two more days. Now, Jesus is not only worthy of all glory and deserves it, but it's what causes lost souls to come to him. We had many people got saved that year we won the state tournament. Now, we need to let Christ do things in his way and in his time while we just stay faithful and trusting and thankful. Okay. Now the next test comes. Okay. The the test of real life or real death comes, and it's for his disciples. Okay. Jesus spent most of the first two years of his ministry in Galilee, up around where he was from. I'm finally learning the difference in these areas and what was going on, and I'm going to try to get some maps out pretty soon and and show show y'all uh, and help y'all understand these things. But uh, Jesus spent the biggest part of two years, first two years in Galilee, away from Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem, Judea, that was the main area of Israel uh, where he was going to be crucified and all that. And uh, But it, he spent time away partly because uh, there in Judea, 
uh, in, in that area, Jerusalem, uh, there was already so much animosity toward him. Every time he came near that place, they tried to kill him. And because he came near and the multitudes saw him and knew who it was and flocked to him, uh, he couldn't be hidden. You know, the, the whole area knew that he was there and he would be in trouble. He would be in danger. All right, now, every time he went near there, they tried to kill him. Imagine the 12 disciples who didn't have the Holy Spirit in them yet. They were known as followers, supporters, personal disciples of Jesus Christ. If they're trying to kill Jesus, they're certainly going to come after us too, they probably thought. Every time we go to Jerusalem, uh, boy, there's so much fear and danger there because they're, they're out to kill him and we're with him. Right? So Jesus says, look in verse 7. Jesus says, let's go there. He says, then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. <laughs> okay. This is a test for the disciples. Watch their immediate response in verse 8. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Okay, so they immediately respond, uh, saying, hey, last time we was there, they tried to kill you. And you want to go back? His disciples say unto him, Master of Jews, uh, Sot Sony. Okay, it says, uh, it says that, that, and I think they're, I think they're nervous. I think they're scared. He had recently showed them he's all that they need to not have to be dismayed. That was one of the other miracles, being afraid. That's what that means. He had recently showed them that, uh, uh, to, to, they needed to walk in the light and they wouldn't have to walk in any darkness. So look at verse 9 and 10. It says, Jesus answered, uh, there, Are there not yet, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if any man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. So here they are scared. He just taught them about being, uh, they don't have to be uh, dismayed, afraid. They don't have to be scared. They don't have to walk in darkness. We learned that when he uh, went out uh, uh, or when he uh, healed the blind man, okay, and, uh, uh, and that miracle. And But here they are. They're scared. And he says, are you walking in the light or not? So in essence, Jesus says, are you still afraid or not? Whoever walks in the light isn't afraid of the dark. Are you afraid? Are you in darkness? Do you have the light or not? In other words, have you believed? Are you, are you saved or not? Will you trust me when I ask you to do something dangerous or scary? Will you trust me with it? 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Do you know you're saved or not? Have you proved it? Have you, ha have you got that settled? Examine yourselves and make sure. Are you in the darkness or not? Perhaps he was also giving Judas another chance to believe. Judas was there. He was walking in darkness. Maybe he was giving him another chance. Maybe he was uh, showing and establishing, you trust, you believe in me, you'll be okay. So Jesus tests their eternal life, their salvation, and at the same time tests their physical life where they are. You see, to them, to go to Judea at the time was to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It was to go where death was lurking and there was a great possibility of dying physically, of getting physically put to death. Don't we all do that? We're, we fear for our life. Something comes along and we say, I ain't going there. I'm not doing that. You know, something might happen. <laughs> I want to live. All right, and that's what, uh, that that's the way uh, we think, okay? And so, let me find, I'm adjusted here. 
Uh, so, so Jesus, in essence, is saying, will you go with me? Will you fear for your life or will you trust me? Will you love this life more and try to hang on to it? Or will you love the next life more enough to take courage to face danger to do what's right? Will you try to hold on to your life and live in fear and worry and uh, not even enjoy your life? Or will you give it up in order to really live? Boy, that's a good question, ain't it? You only really live. You don't really live when you try to hold on to your life and make it worth living. You end up in fear uh, uh, and, and all of that. Now, note. Living by faith in Jesus, letting him live in you, is to really, really live. I think they were still, even though he's there and he, he brings this out and does a little preaching to them. He, you see, he's putting them to a test. He's testing their faith. He's testing their, uh, their fear, see if they're uh, trusting in him and walking in the light. But I think their faith or I think they're still a little bit shaky over the whole deal. So Jesus says in verse 11, says, these things he said, or said he, and after that he saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. So here, the test is still here. Okay, he's saying Lazarus sleepeth, I, I'm going to wake him up. Their quick response is, well, if he sleep, he will do well. Verse 12, then says his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Everybody knows if a person is sick and they get to sleep, their body will heal. They may overcome the, the fever or the sickness and uh, come out of it. But why did they say that so quickly? In other words, I think they're saying uh, he, he's probably okay. Uh, let's stay put. Let's stay here. We, we don't have to go. If he's sleeping, he'll be all right. Uh, they don't need us. <laughs> you see, they're still... I, I think they're they're still a little bit shaky. That's that's so like us. We can be dumb and not pick up on the simplest, plainest things in life, unless it's for our well-being. Especially if we're scared, then we won't miss a thing. I mean, we'll be quick to to respond with things that are going to protect us or get us what we want, keeping us from having. Uh, to, to do something uh, that we're afraid of, okay? <clears throat> now, I may be wrong uh, about all of that uh, to some degree. I, I don't know. Uh, but note too, notice this. They spoke as if concerned for Jesus' safety. Now, I think they loved him, and I think they worried for him too. Uh, but uh, uh, you notice they said, the last time you went there, they tried to stone you. You know, as if they're so concerned about him. When you're scared, when we're scared, don't we do that? They they likely feared for their own lives, okay? <laughs> and uh, it's easy to fake bravery by deferring to someone else. Yeah, yeah, mm, yeah, yeah I, you know, I'm not scared, but I, you know, I don't want you to go there because, uh, you know, you'd be in danger. Notice this, though. Jesus didn't say, you guys need to go to Judea. He said, let's go to Judea. He never sends us where he hasn't been already and where he don't go before us and with us. Amen? Jesus wants to increase their faith. He wants to strengthen them by the use of trials and tests. So he has this test for them. We're going to go into Judea. What do y'all think about that? Well, I don't think we ought to go. If he's sleeping, they got hung up on the sleep thing without even missing what he was actually saying. You know, and, and all of these things, you know, they tried to get out of it. Verse 15, Jesus says, excuse me, Verse 14, then said Jesus unto them, plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent ye may believe, 
Nevertheless, let us go unto him. So he said, I'm doing this. He let them know there's a reason in all of this that you may believe. Isn't that what John is trying to do all the way through this book? Get people to see Jesus as God, the Son, and believe on him unto salvation. That's what he wants. And those who are saved, he wants to get them to believe more and trust and live for him more. Okay? So he says, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that you may believe. So Thomas, the doubter, says, then let's go there and die. Look in verse 15 or 16. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, I don't think he was being, you know, brave and courageous and bold and, yeah, I'm ready. Let's go here and die. Even though deep down he was probably willing to do it, but it don't mean he wasn't scared. Right? I think he was just kind of, okay, then we can't get out of it. <laughs> then let's just go and die if that's what's going to happen. Okay? He had some faith. I believe they all did. Okay? And they had some courage because they were willing to go. That's what Jesus wants for us to face fear to face hardship, to trust him and go where he says to go. <sighs> then he can show us who he really is and what he really can do. Listen to me. Jesus is God's answer to man's death. They were afraid to die. Okay, they were afraid of dying. Jesus was the answer. Okay. Now, once it was clear that Lazarus was dead and not asleep, right? Uh, we find uh, that in a little bit that uh, he was. He, first, he was talking about that, and they didn't pick up on. It, he meant death, all right? Then he makes it plain: Lazarus is dead. Okay, but once they, once it was clear that Lazarus was dead and not asleep, they should, they should have realized that Jesus aimed to raise him back to life, since Jesus said. He had to wake him up in verse 11. These things said he, and after that he says unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. So he had said that at the beginning. I'm going to wake him up. Then a few minutes later he said, ah, He's not really sleeping. He's dead. They should have picked up on it that, well, if, he's, if, if sleep means dead, then if he's dead and he said he's going to wake him up, he must be going to raise him from the dead. They should have picked up on that. Now, whether they didn't pick up on it at all, whether they didn't understand it, whether they didn't believe it, I don't know. So often, it's probably one or the other, but so often we're so wrapped up in our own life, our own fears, our own concerns, our own agendas, what we got going on, that we won't even hear the important things someone so often, so many uh, often, so so many times, Jesus himself is speaking to us. God is talking to us. And he's trying to say a certain thing, an important thing, something real, something big. And all we can see is the thing that has our attention. And we miss the main point. Now, let's go on. Jesus didn't delay waiting for Lazarus to die. I want to point that out. I always kind of thought that he, I always kind of thought, well, they said he's sick. Why did Jesus wait around two more days? Okay, but he didn't wait. He did wait around two more days, but he didn't wait for Lazarus to die. In verse three, you can look, the messenger, whoever that was, they sent someone to find Jesus and tell him, tell him that, that Lazarus is sick, okay? The messenger said he was sick. He didn't say he was dead. But apparently, uh, the messenger, whoever he was, uh, apparently Lazarus had died while the messenger was on the way. It was a one or two day journey. Jesus being God knew Okay, that Lazarus was dead already. He was already dead. And says in verse 14, very plainly, Lazarus is dead. Jesus already knew it. 
Lazarus was already dead. The messenger didn't know it, but Jesus did. Now, not only do we uh, do we really know nothing, and Jesus knows everything, but when everyone, including ourselves, think we're alive, God knows we're really dead without him. You see, everyone else said, well, if he's sleeping, you know, if he's, if he's, uh, you know, he's still alive, everything's okay, then we either don't need to go or whatever. But Jesus knew he's already dead. He's dead. And nobody even really knows about it. And that's the way, the way it is with us. We're dead in sins. Born dead inside. Okay? And don't even know it. And people go along in darkness. They go along dead. And don't even know it. And only Jesus knows that they're actually dead. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let me find my place. Um, Jesus, again, is God's answer to man's death. He's, a, he's God's answer to death. Now look in verses 17, 18, and 19. The Bible says, Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off, about two miles. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. So Jesus comes to the edge of town, probably close to where the cemetery or the grave was. Okay, not quite at it, but he comes there and uh, 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 and he lingers or stops or, or whatever, whatever there, right? Um, and and so, but I want you to notice that these Jews, okay, these Jews who came to comfort uh, Mary and Martha. Okay, they were likely family or friends who knew and loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha. This was a family, uh, this family, uh, Lazarus and Mary and them, were a family of position and su substance. They had some wealth and they had some sway and uh, were highly respected and looked up to in that, in that town, in that area. Everybody knew them. So there likely was a lot of people there. Okay, many people who weren't saved. When someone in your family dies, what happens? Everyone they know sooner or later comes to pay their respects. They usually bring some food and, and hang out for a while and try to talk with you and comfort you. Okay, now the unsaved, the, uh, many of these people were, were unsaved. The unsaved could only offer comfort such as remembering Lazarus as he was when he was alive. Oh, he was a good man, you know. Oh, he had a good sense of humor, you know, all those good qualities about him. And let's, let's remember him for who. That's the only comfort the, the unsaved could give them. But they came to comfort them and to, to help them, okay? <clears throat> uh, let me find my place. Okay, the saved ones, there are probably some there that were saved as well that came to visit. The saved ones could certainly encourage them that we'll get to see him again. And that is comfort. That is encouragement. There is hope for the Christian even in death. But listen to me. Only Jesus could bring the greatest comfort of all. Life out of death. Okay? Resurrection. Canceling their grief altogether. Talk about a family reunion. Amen. Changing hurt and sorrow to complete joy and excitement. From devastation to celebration. Amen. Imagine some people coming later after Lazarus had already come back to life. Imagine some people coming later uh, to bring a dish, you know, for the family and to cry with them and comfort them. And they knock on the door and Lazarus opens up the door. Imagine their surprise. Well, here, Lazarus, I came to, it's you. What are you, how is this? You're not supposed to, I thought we several days, I was there. Imagine their surprise. Okay, the joy 
uh, instead uh, of it becoming them bringing comfort food to help the family, it becomes a feast, okay, a celebration. Now, Jesus is the inter uh, interrupter of death, amen. Jesus is the interrupter of funerals. He, he interrupts sorrow. He's the one we need to bring into our family, into our life, okay? And if someone dies, we need to bring him to the funeral. Jesus is God's answer to death. Jesus is the answer to death. Now, we have no time. I, I've got to move on. I, I am trying to hurry here. We, we don't have time. I don't have time to go. In. There was so much in this chapter. I... I couldn't even begin to touch every bit of it, okay? And I don't have time for the conversations with Martha and Mary hardly, uh, as when Jesus came into town and they found out and they came out to the edge of town to see him one at a time, Martha first and then Mary. Uh, but I do want to point out a couple of things. Uh, uh, that uh, Jesus did comfort both of them. Now, he comforted them in different ways. Martha comes up very bold, and she had a different temperament than Mary did, and uh, she comes up and says, Lord, if you'd only been there, my our brother wouldn't have died. Okay, uh, but he was nice and gentle and kind. He comforted her and he helped her. Uh, and then, of course, Mary came a little later and uh, she bowed down at Jesus' feet. She was emotional and and a very gentle soul. And uh, uh, and he comforted her differently so that they both went off feeling a little better. All right, uh, but totally helping both of them and strengthening their faith. As he did it, that's what he uh, his custom was. That's what he wanted to do. That's what John wanted to bring out. Is that God, Jesus is God's answer to death, for death for someone else that we know, or uh, because they've died, he's God's answer to us when someone close to us has died. All right, and so. I want you to notice this, that Jesus wept. This is the passage, and I'm not preaching on that today. Uh, but uh, Jesus wept. <clears throat> he really did and does hurt when he sees us, his friends and family, hurting so much. Jesus really does hurt, and he really does cry. Now, though he did say to Martha, look in verse uh, 25 and 26. Okay, and this ought to be pointed out. I am the resurrection and the life, he says. And he that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall not, shall never die. Believest thou this? So he asked Martha. Here he is with her, and he's talking with her. And uh, uh, he says, do you believe this? She said in uh, verse 27, says, then, or she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. All right? So, uh, uh, and then she went away comforted. Now, Jesus stayed there, not too far from the grave, as I said. He stays in that place. And, uh, uh, and following Mary, verse 31 says, the Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary that uh, she rose up hastily and went out and uh, followed her saying she goeth into the grave to weep. So here are the comforters, the mourners, the people that are there with Mary. Uh, they're with her and Martha comes and says the master calleth for you and, and Jesus uh, or she jumps up and runs out and they follow her thinking you know, she must be going to the grave to, to weep or to mourn. Okay, uh, <clears throat> and so uh, there she was, uh, and here come this bunch of Jews, likely mostly ladies, okay, but they were there with Mary, mourning for her. They were Jews, many of who were opposed to Jesus. From my studying and understanding, uh, uh, the Jews in Judea and most, most of the people around here, even though they loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus and the family and they were good friends with him, they knew they were good people, they didn't like Jesus. They didn't believe on him, all right? And they were against him. Now, they weren't there to cause trouble. I think that made it easier at this funeral, this uh, death in the family situation. And, uh, uh, and so they were there, and here comes Jesus, and they're not fond of him, but they're not going to say much uh, for Mary and him's sake. 
So they come following Mary out to meet Jesus. All right. Uh, when they see, pretty soon they see Jesus weeping. Verse 35 says Jesus wept. Uh, some, some of them, I think, kind of soften up toward him. They start seeing he's a real person who really loves them and he came, you know, for this situation. Okay, now let's read 35, 36, 37. It says, let me find it. it says, Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Okay, so here they are. And uh, some of them have sympathy towards Jesus. I think they're softening up a little bit. They're thinking, maybe he's not so bad. Maybe he's a good man. Some of them don't. Some of them keep up with their questioning. Uh, couldn't this man have... I have kept him from dying too. If he healed the eyes of the blind, why couldn't he heal them? Why couldn't he heal Lazarus, our friend? He claims to be God. See, I think they were still antagonistic with their questionings and probably that. Uh, uh, couldn't he have healed him? If he really loved him, uh, he wouldn't have uh, took so long getting here, okay, that he had already died. Note the word couldn't or could not. If he could have prevented uh Lazarus's death he would have but apparently he couldn't i guess he ain't who he claims to be is he crying from grief over Lazarus and the family does he really love them or is he crying because he failed to help uh, uh by by keeping him from dying and helping the family but Christ, Jesus, soon silences these whisperers by raising his, this beloved friend who'd been dead for four days, okay, and stinketh, all right, raising him from the dead. He soon silences their, their thinking and their whispers and their questions, changes it all, all right? That's what God does, and that's what the glory of God is. He does great and amazing and wonderful things, so much so that sooner or later, with all of our doubts and all of our fears and all of our resistance and our rejection, he can break the heart of stone and he can make it into a heart of, of flesh and soft and, and make us believe, and that's what he's going to do. Jesus, okay, <clears throat> is God's answer to death. All right, he uh, uh, he wanted and needed to get the glory, so he silences them. All right, and uh, it it made the work that he did wind up doing even greater because God got the glory. Now look in verse thirty nine. I keep looking on the wrong side. Jesus said, "Take ye away the stone." Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, "Lord, by this time he stinketh." For he hath been dead for days. All right? Jesus says, okay. He made it to the graveside. He said, okay, take away the stone. Martha protests. He stinketh. You can't, you can't do this. Who wants to smell that? After someone been in the grave for four days. Who wants to open that thing back up again? We're talking about people uh, they, they, that we, we embalm them nowadays and all that, and their body lasts a long time and, and all that. But back then, they, they didn't have that. And, uh, and so who wants that? Certainly the family wouldn't want to have to smell the rotting flesh of their own brother. And certainly they didn't want to have their brother disrespected by opening it up and having the, the sight looking in there or the, the smell and all of the decay. But Jesus persisted that if she just believed, she'd witness something great. She'd witness what the resurrection is talking about. Okay, so probably they had some servants. And I, I think God uh, knew he was doing. Jesus, you know, uh, uh, in all of this, had different people that needed to hear, needed to see, needed to be involved in this, needed to believe. Uh, he had them there so that they could witness that he's God and that he's 
uh, he can do anything and that uh, so that they could believe on him and be saved. Okay, and so uh, uh, so here he is, and so he probably, uh, they probably have some servants remove the stone, and, and think about this, here they remove the stone, and as they uncovered that thing, uh, the smell of the putrefying, you know, body and all of that starts coming out, and the, thus they know that he truly is dead. It's how God raises dead souls to spiritual life. Did you know that? Helping them know they are truly dead in sin and that it's rotten and there ain't nothing good about it and that they need Jesus, the Savior. So Jesus prays, verse 41 and 42, says, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So he prays to show his power comes from God, that he himself is the power of God. Uh, sent from God and to help those there to believe on him. Okay? And, and I believe he prayed with, with power and he prayed uh, already believing. I thank you that you've already answered my prayer, what I'm fixing to do. He didn't have hesitation. He didn't say the words and, you know, look in, 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 you know, and hope that it would come. So they would, no, no. He said it very boldly and very confidently because he was God, and he wanted them to see this. Now, in verse 43, it says, And when he had, or when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. I had the question, why did he cry with a loud voice? Why didn't he just say, Lazarus, come forth? Okay. Uh, God don't even have to speak at all to get something done, but he chooses to use words which represent who he is. Listen, Jesus is God's word to man. And that's why in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And uh, uh, the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him and, and all that. And uh, because Jesus is the word of God to man. And when God spoke the word, uh, the worlds and the planets and everything came into his existence and he created everything and he put them in their place just by speaking his word. And listen, uh, uh, that's that's what it is. That's where the power is. I think uh, that, uh, but, but notice he didn't just speak, he shouted. Okay? I think he shouted because that's what we're going to hear in the resurrection, his loud trumpet voice. Okay, and it's going to be loud, and everyone on earth is going to hear it. Now, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18, I want to read these uh, real quick. Uh, <clears throat> it says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with think that I just had to read that portion of scripture because it fits this whole thing. Comfort one another with these words. Sleep means death, okay, for the Christian. And it's a sweet way of saying it. Man, when you go to sleep at night and it's sweet, right? oh, and you sleep so good. Well, that's what God says of the Christian who dies. He, he just fell asleep. and uh, uh, But it means death. It means they died and they're, he's going to bring them back with him again because they're with him now, And uh, but they're going to rise again. And uh, 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 and all of this, and but it's going to be from the trump of God and the voice of God and the shout that comes, and uh, uh, and then all we which are alive and those who are dead is going to we're going to rise to meet Him in the air. All right? See, it's talking about the resurrection. It's talking about life. 
from death. Okay? So, <clears throat> Jesus is God's answer to death, to man's death. Now, Jesus had already raised two others from the dead. We mentioned that earlier. On all three occasions, this one and the other two, Jesus merely spoke and lifeless corpses came alive again. All three times, he spoke a word and they came alive. This reinforces John's amazing claim in John 5.25 that all the dead in the world will hear his voice and come alive again. That's what he said. The dead are going to hear his voice and come alive again. And that's what happens. Okay? <clears throat> it's how I got saved. He spoke his word. I believed it. And this sinner became a saint. Okay? This dead sinner became a living saint. Now here's another thing in this story, and I'm, I'm winding it down. No sooner had Jesus spoken the word, Lazarus come forth, than here comes this man out of the grave. Verse 44. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was uh, bound about with napkin. Jesus saith unto him, Loose him and let him go. No sooner had Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, he got up and came out of there. Let me say, when the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and you believe in him, your dead soul will come alive instantly. And you'll know it. When I got saved, I knew I got saved. I knew it happened. I know when it happened. I was in that Sunday school room. Okay, and, and it happened in my dead soul. I, I heard the word of God and I believed it. And just like that, I became a living soul with eternal life. Okay, <clears throat> that's what it is. Listen, Jesus is God's answer to man's death. Any kind of death, Jesus is the answer. And as soon as as soon as he speaks it, and as soon as he saves you, you become alive, okay? Now, the climax of the glory of God, oh, I missed a, missed a spot there. No sooner had he spoke it, comes out of the, out of the grave, okay? Uh, Lazarus comes out of the grave. Uh, okay, and, uh, oh, that's what, I, that's what I forgot. So, no sooner had he spoke it, he came... Uh, here came Lazarus out of the grave, and uh, uh, when the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and you believe on him, your dead soul will become alive instantly, okay? And thus, our final resurrection will be the same thing. When Jesus comes, as we read in First Thessalonians a while ago, when Jesus comes, it will happen in the twinkling of an eye. We will, we will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Our dead bodies uh, or if we're still alive, our bodies will be changed into glorified bodies. Now, the climax of the glory of God is in verse 45, and then we'll be done. It says, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. We're talking about the Jews, these Jews that were against God. Many of them were, were opposed to him and, uh, uh, and followed the, the crowd of the Pharisees or whatever, and, and uh, they were against God, and, but they were here mourning, and Jesus uh, waited two days, and he comes, and here's this big crowd. They're watching at this, uh, at this situation of this man, and I don't think he was all that old, and he had died, and, uh, and they were grieving and sorrowful, and Jesus comes in, and uh, he says, roll the stone away, and here's the, the stink, and uh, all of this stuff, and everyone's watching, and some of them, these Jews, they question him, you know, could this be God, and if he was God, then uh, why didn't he come earlier, and why didn't he, couldn't he, the one who had, had opened the blind eyes, uh, this guy who was born from birth blind, and, and, and couldn't he do that, uh, couldn't he have kept this man from dying, and he's probably not God, but boy, Lazarus comes out of that grave and it puts it puts all of their doubts and their questions aside. And many of those Jews believed in him. You see, they got saved. That's why John 
wrote this book. John shows that it ain't about the miracles. It ain't about uh, any of that. It's about the miracle worker, Jesus. Okay? John's gospel, his life, our life, the Bible, everything. It's all about Jesus Christ. It's not about you. It's not about your family. It's about Jesus, the Son of God, who came to die that we might live. And not just live, but live in victory and power and joy in him. And not just that, but live forever with him. Amen. That's good stuff, Brother Andy. I got to wrap it up. Conclusion. Have you believed on Jesus? Has he dealt with your soul? Has he raised you from de being dead in your sins to having a new life? Has he done that? Has he dealt with, with uh, and done away with all your possible trouble? If, if you are saved, has he dealt with these things? Or if you're not saved, has he dealt with and gotten rid of your problems and your troubles? See, Jesus is God's answer to our disappointments, to our doubts. He's God's answer to our disability, to our desires, our dismay, that's fears. Jesus is God's answer to our darkness. He is God's answer to death. We, we sing that song, uh, I forget how it goes, but it, it talks about uh, the, the last verse of it. And it always meant a lot to me that uh, if you're afraid to die, you know, you, you, you trust in Jesus or you call on Jesus. Get, tell it to Jesus, I think. Are you troubled at the thought of dying? I was so troubled when I was a little boy. Not long after that, Jesus answered my prayer and saved me and used that song to confirm it. I'm not troubled at the thought of dying anymore. And uh, But do you worry? Do you wonder? Do you question? Are you fearful? Are you afraid? Are you walking in darkness? Are you afraid to die? Or do you have it settled? I have Jesus. I have life. He is the resurrection and the life. I don't need anything else. I'm not worried about dying. Now, these seven miracles in uh, the Gospel of John, the word seven is completion. It's the number of uh, completeness or finishing things. John showed that Jesus is the perfect Son of God and the perfect Savior who completes us with his perfect salvation and power to make us whole. Are you a whole person? Are you completed? Do you have Jesus, God's answer to everything you possibly need? I hope that you do. If you don't, you can get it today by believing on him and, and hearing his word and believing it and let him save you. I hope you'll do that. If you need any help with it, let me know. Uh, meanwhile, we're going to dismiss. Hope you've enjoyed this series and it's been a blessing to you. Let's pray. Our dear Father, come to you again, Lord. And thank you for the word of God, how wonderful it is. Lord, we pray that you bless this, this uh, speaking, this teaching, preaching. I pray, God, that you would work and do more miracles in more people's lives. They're lost through the miracle of salvation. Truly save them, make them know it, and be excited to know you. If we're saved, if they're saved, I pray that you do miracles that strengthen uh, our faith and make us to see and know and believe in you more. Go with us now today. We love you. Thank you for loving us. We ask everything in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Thanks for coming or watching or whatever it may be. And uh, we'll see you when we see you. God bless. Pastor Andy.